Good morning, Waterdam. It's good to be with all of you. I uh, want to say thank you to the ladies that learned how to make cookies last night. I, uh, I never got to try any. My wife didn't go to this event. We were at a retirement party for uh, Brian Day. Is Brian here? I don't know if he's here today, but please uh, pray for Brian and uh, pray for uh, um, us as we try to figure out what he can do in his retirement. <laughs> you don't retire in the Bible, right? Amen. All right, Paul, I remember you said that. <laughs> And uh, so we want to we want to encourage everyone. We also want to encourage uh, Dana Miller and her family. The we didn't know the information. We didn't have it for sure when we sent out the information about her mom's passing. Her name is Carol Walters. She will be uh, their viewing will be from two to four, six to eight at Fry Funeral Home in Monongahela, and then the funeral will be held on Monday the next day. So if you'd like to stop by and say hello to Dana, but if, in the meantime, please pray for them as they walk through this time. Dana did a lot of the caregiving and, uh, with her family, and so uh, she's uh, one of these people that's been trained as an ambulance driver. She's got all this background of medical help, and uh, so oftentimes we rely on those people uh, to help us when we're uh, not feeling well, and she did that with her mom. So please pray for her and her husband, Daryl. And then also uh, we want to continue to pray for uh, our church family. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, come before you now as we think about drawing near and putting our confidence in you. Our confidence needs to remain in there as we think about all that you provide in your son, Jesus Christ. After all, we seek to come to him, and we seek to come to him and find mercy, mercy, unmerited favor for our sins and for our help and encouragement, to find help in our time of need at your throne. We ask now, Lord, that you would bless us with your son, Jesus, as he speaks to our hearts through your scripture. We pray now, God, that you would just be with us as we come to you. We pray that you would bless all that we are about. We pray that you would bless Dana with her family as we think about Dana and her her family that she's been through. All of this, we ask, Lord, for strength and endurance and encouragement. We pray that she would be blessed by having the body come around her with prayer and girding her up with that prayer. As we look to you now for our help and for the blessing of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray, God, that you would help us to put our confidence truly in Christ as we seek him at this time to speak to us. We also pray for Jake Meldrum. We continue to pray for Jake as he... Um, is in the greenery. We ask, Lord, for your blessing on him as well as others. We look to you for your help and strength for the Collins family and the Hubers, as well as April Hensey and others. We thank you, Lord, for blessing them with your son, Jesus Christ, and his hope and his encouragement. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with us now that we would put our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we, uh, as we consider what we're about today. Last week, I, uh, I talked about uh, kind of my, my kids. They were, I, I think they were here. I talked about every once in a while, their rooms looked like a, an explosion went off. I won't tell you which kid, because they're here. They may throw things at me or something, but they, that, that, you know, you tell them to put it away. And then we had rules in our house. I've shared with you from time to time um, that I used to have 11 o'clock curfew. I still have that curfew. I've never lifted that curfew. And my kids would say, you know, Dad, when we're out with our friends at college, I said, well, that's at college. That's not here at my house. You're here at my house. If you're under my roof, you're under my rules. Right. Some of you may have said that to your children. And so and if you're under my roof. And so what we tried to do, though, is that I love you. I care about you. But I set rules. And then I told them that I loved them. I cared for them. I I allowed them to live under my roof. I fed them. I, I, you know, the whole list of things that you tell your kids when you're telling them about the blessings and benefits of being under your roof. But the idea being not that you would be too harsh or too lenient, right? There's a middle ground somewhere that you're establishing rules plus relationship. Now, when Meredith got married and I got to give the big speech at the end, I told her while I was dancing with her, I said, your curfew has been lifted. And she goes, thanks, Dad. (laughs) 
But it was a good, I, and she, she looked, at, it, she, the face, her face, the look on her face was priceless. I still remember um, that we we're talking. Now that she's had a baby and that baby is crawling around, they're already talking about what kind of rules they're going to lay down. And you should hear the rules. And I just smiled and I said, it's not easy being cheesy, is it, Meredith? I said, now you're the one and you're setting rules and you've got to have the relationship. And that's little thing there, that little, uh, little beautiful little thing right there, it's full of just joy, and that, they're going to test your rules. They're going to push you to the limits of where you never have thought you could go. It's going to be like Star Trek. No man has gone before. <laughs> and every once in a while, you're going to feel like saying, beam me out of here, Scotty. <laughs> but the idea is that you're trying to establish something. You're trying to put down fence that shouldn't be removed to protect them, not to hurt them, not to harm them. And so as we look at this and we think about what God has for us, as we think about putting our confidence in Christ, remember the writer is warning the people, the principle of this, while the promise of entering God's rest still stands, the way is open, but it's only open for a limited amount of time. The second thing, the way is narrow, the way is narrow, and few find it. So it's serious business here. God is telling us through the writer of Hebrews that to the people that are in the church, he's saying, don't get, don't get uh, kind of too lenient with this. Don't, don't look at this lackadaisical. Just because you've been driving for a long time and you've been going down the road, if you're not paying attention, the minute you have an accident, what do you do when you go down the road the next time? You pay a lot of attention. And so what he's saying is, you're driving down the road here. Don't get lax with this. Don't, don't drift from it. And then he emphasizes the pattern to follow the one day and seven cycle, the rest from your labor of self-sufficiency to turn your life over and gather in God's house, gather with God's family around God and his rhythm. When we gather ourselves around God and his rhythm, it resets mine to his rhythm and not my own because we can drift away from that. And then we want to make sure that we strive, it says, at the very end of chapter 4, verse 11, it says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Pete's translation last week when he read, he said, make every effort to enter that rest. Don't be lackadaisical about it. Don't neglect it. Don't doubt the word of God, because doubt leads to what? Falling away, he said, from the living God. Falling away from the living God which eventually leads to death because the warnings were all about the people not entering God's rest. Thousands of people didn't enter into God's rest. So he says, and then he says something very interesting. Remember, I, I shared with you the doctor knew that I needed heart surgery. He didn't tell me everything. He just basically said my carburetor, need, carburetor needed more gas. And I started thinking about that after I said that last week. And I'm thinking... I guess he didn't want to tell me that I had several occlusions and that they were very, very, uh, he didn't want to tell me all about the medical terminology. He said, and I think he did it for me, he reached down to me, you know, because he, he noticed that I wasn't the sharpest drawer in the knife, so he said, you know, your carburetor needs more gas. I know, I understand that. So I, and I knew I had arm pain down both arms, so it's like, I'm getting something out of this, I need, I need it, so... The carburetor with the gas thing, I understand that, so I'm going to get it. That's, that's, I just felt, and then, like, so now I'm here today talking to you guys, and I'm thinking, you know, what I may say, you may kind of write off and think that it's only for seminary students, but what I want to share with you is that it's not for just seminary students. It's for all of us today. So the temptation is going to be, well, that's for theologians. This is, this is very serious here because he's warning us, and he's warning us of drifting and doubting and then leading to death, not entering into God's rest. And so listen to what uh, this says. Make sure we enter God's rest. Martin Luther commented on this text. After terrifying us, the apostle now comforts us. After pouring wine into our wound, he now pours in oil. It's from the Philip Hughes commentary, the epistle to the Hebrews. He says, rather than trying to hide because of our sin, the author shows us that those who are in Christ, that the throne is not a place of fear, but rather a throne of grace. So 
when we're trying to get our children to come to us. They don't have to fear us. They can come to us. So God's, this is a picture of what he's saying, is that God's throne of grace. What does it say about God's throne of grace? That we can find help in our time of need. We can find mercy and grace. Mercy being unmerited favor. Not getting what we deserve. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what he's saying that you'll find. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of God. Come to this. Come to him in prayer. So who do we come to? We come and we're putting our confidence not in ourselves. Because after all, if you looked in my closet, and my wife will attest to this, is that my closet looks like a bomb went off in it after a while. Because what do I do? My wife says, I don't want your clothes laying on the bed. I don't want your underwear laying on the floor. So what do I do? I open it up and I throw everything up on top. And then I shut the door. It's out of sight, out of mind. It's good enough for me. But then after a while, I can't find my T-shirts because they're buried under my underwear. Sometimes my old underwear. (laughs) So just it covers it up. He's saying here, no, all of us need Christ. I need Christ. And I'm no better than my kids. I, my closet's messy too. So the, the word of God, he says, is active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And that it, 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 it reveals things about us. That it said no creature is hidden from God's eye. That, that we are naked before God. That the word of God reveals that. If you look there at the end of chapter 4, it says that it divides soul and spirit of joints and marrow, discerning the very thoughts and the intentions of our heart. That, that it, God can read our minds. You remember Jesus did that with the apostles sometimes or with the priests. He knew what they were thinking. And so as we look at this, God is telling us that no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes to him who we must give an account. That's how he ends off in chapter 4. So we are being looked at with God's eyes, with the gaze of the Holy Spirit right now. God's examining what's going on in your mind and in your heart. He's going into my mind. And into my heart. So I must be careful with this. And I must approach God with confidence in Christ. And not in myself. I too am a sinner. So first thing is that in verse 14, right out of the gate, he tells us something about Jesus. Jesus is the high priest. Now immediately, you may be tempted to say, well, that's only for seminarians. That's only for theologians. But it's not. He's giving us a picture here of what and who Jesus is. He's saying, since then we have a great high priest. After he just told us we've been exposed, he's warned us, we have a great high priest. The first thing he says is that since we have a great high priest. The writer does not refer to Jesus as our life coach here to make it a applicable to the modern day mind. He's talking to a Jewish audience and he's saying, Jesus is our great high priest. He's the high priest above every other priest. He's not just a life coach or some teacher, uh, some modern term. He uses a picture of Jesus from the Exodus, which we just came out of. Now, people wonder why I teach out of the New Testament, and I go back to the Old Testament, why do I go to the Old Testament back into the New Testament? Because it's all God's Word, and it's to help you kind of lock in the reasons behind what God is wanting to teach us, that He's sovereign over history. He didn't just react with Jesus. He planned Jesus from before the creation of time to come and save us from our sins. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. Now, we can't hardly wrap our minds around that, but God is sovereign over history. This was part of God's plan for him to be our high priest. It was also part of God's plan to establish sacrifices and offerings back in the Old Testament. 
to help people see that their sins are hurting their relationship. They're separating them from God and that they need someone to come before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for them. They can't approach God. They've been curtained off. Remember, we talked about that in Exodus. In Exodus, the the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, is separated off. So what does a high priest do? Well, he's appointed by God, not by men. Secondly, that God would not admit sinful man to come to him immediately and alone without a high priest who must be taken from among men. For what purpose was the high priest ordained? That he might offer both gifts and sacrifices for our sins. This intimates, says Matthew Henry, that we all bring to God must be free and not forced. What we bring to God must be free and not forced. So can you imagine if you had to get up today and offer one of your animals when you came to church? That's what they had to do. It would cost them something. Sin was costly. You had to sacrifice one of your your animals. You couldn't come to God without it. And so as we look at this, that we might offer a sacrifice for sin that is, must be handled by the high priest's hands as he is the great agent between God and man, that he might offer sacrifices for sin, that is the offerings that were appointed to make atonement that sin might be pardoned and sinners accepted so that my sins could be pardoned and that I might be accepted and be acceptable to God. But I could not enter into the Holy of Holies I needed the high priest to enter in before me. The whole nation, the high priest, would once a year come before God, but he had to do something. He had to offer a sacrifice for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. And so God says, since we have this high priest, Christ, he says, has ascended. He ascended into heaven. As we think about that, what does that mean? That Notice in the verse, it says something interesting, that he passed up through the heavens. Why is that important? Well, not only did Jesus live, he died, he was buried for three days, and then he was raised. But he didn't stay on the earth. What did it say when the disciples kept looking up and they watched him ascend into heaven? That he had gone where no man had gone before. He ascended into heaven. He went behind the curtain. He went into the direct holy of holies right beside God, it says. You understand? So God is locking in the picture from the Old Testament and giving us a picture in the New Testament. The shadow of things was in the Old Testament. The revelation, the true picture of the true high priest actually going into God, actually ascending into heaven and passing through the curtain of the clouds, into the throne room of heaven, Jesus Christ went as our high priest, offering a sacrifice, not for himself, but for all of us who receive him and believe upon him. So what is so powerful about this is that it says that once he ascended into heaven, the book of Hebrews makes it very clear that he sat down at the right hand of the Father, that there was no more need for a sacrifice for sins. No more need for a sacrifice of sins. No more need for a earthly priest to be given your sacrifice and be brought before God. You can go directly to God through Jesus. Now, that's all groundwork. But it's important groundwork. It's impacted us today. I will get to that in a minute. Greg Stand, I wrote to him, and it's interesting because I asked him about altar calls, and I asked him something about it, and he wrote back, and he wrote, Biblically and theologically, an altar is where sacrifice is offered. You remember, inside the Holy of Holies, they had the Ark of the, the, Ark of the Covenant, and it had a covering on it. And inside the Ark was the Ten Commandments, the broken Ten Commandments. And and what it was covered by was the mercy seat of God. Again, the picture of God sitting there. 
that the high priest could not enter into there and that that seat had to be consecrated with blood and then the people had to be consecrated with blood. The, the sins of the people, they had to make atonement for their sins so that they would be pardoned for their sin. So the altar is important. God established under the old covenant by which people could relate to him and be right with him. Secondly, the altar was a center of Israel's worship. The central purpose of the altar was a blood sacrifice. The new covenant was ushered in when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, Hebrews 10, 12. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Now, I'm getting there. Hold on. Don't stop listening to me. This is important. Okay? It is. In the medieval church, the notion of transubstantiation or the notion that the Eucharist, the elements upon the consecration by the priest, actually became the body and blood of Christ in the Mass or a re-sacrifice of the altar. What did we just say? You don't need to re-sacrifice. Christ has offered the ultimate sacrifice. There is no more need for a sacrifice. Jesus has sufficiently satisfies God's requirement of a sacrifice. Now, some of you have been in churches where this chancel is off to the side. There's a lectern over to this side. There's a pulpit over here. I'm going off camera, so they'll have to get over it. But, but keep with me. So what I'm saying to you is that the pulpit would be on one side. The chancel would be here. What's here? The communion table the sacrifice, the sacrament, the altar. Some people call this an altar. We call it a communion table because Christ has sat down and paid our sacrifices. There's no more need to recreate a sacrifice. Now, why do I say that? Because some of our, some of our friends call that the, the unction of the Holy Spirit recreates the sacrifice of Christ and the the body and blood of Jesus is in the elements. That's not right. And if it's not right, my friend Alistair Beggs says, then it must be wrong. Now, what I want to say to you is that I'm not here to fight over transubstantiation or consubstantiation, those terminologies. Because there is a serious thing about taking communion. You are to recognize the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the work of Christ. We are to recognize that it's a memorial to his death, but it's not to be taken lightly because when we take it, we're cautioned when we take it that you need to take it seriously, he said, because that's why some of you are falling asleep and are, some of you are sick for not recognizing and taking it nonchalantly. So it's very important that we understand that since we have a great high priest, he sent it into heaven, and then in Hebrews 7, verse 25, it says that he intercedes for his people. He's praying for us. He's making intercession for us. In the Reformation, there was a change from the Mass to the Lord's Supper, to communion, and with the shift of understanding, the altar was no longer the center of service, but rather the Word and the pulpit became the focal point. The word and the pulpit guiding all of what happens here and directing it. Same way with when we come in, we give a sacrifice of praise when we sing. Now, for some of you, this is challenging what you grew up with, and I understand that. And I don't mean any harm or any offense to you. What I'm trying to do is teach exactly what the Bible says about this, because if we assume things in that understanding without going back to the Old Testament and locking in what they mean by a high priest, and then we come over here to the New Testament, we lose the meaning of it, and we can drift off course. So, what he says to us, what does he say to us in this passage? Let us hold fast to our confession. Let us hold fast to our confession. John Piper said, if you, don't, if you try to skip the Old Testament interpretation of Jesus within your own context first, Without the biblical historical context and categories, you may make him a life coach or a therapist or a good example or a guru or a mentor or a hero or a trailblazer. And there may be some truth, he says, in each of these, but they will not be as true and deep and as authoritative 
and helpful as the categories of the Bible itself. God has given us the Bible to hold on to so we don't drift away from these truths. So we don't make Jesus into something that he's not. Or that we give people false understanding and false hope in certain things, in looking for bells and smells. So we have to be very careful. And he says that instead we need to, to, to make sure that we hold on to the analogies of the Bible and go back to God's context, God's history, and God's book. And learn some deep and wonderful things that we might otherwise miss even to our peril. He says our history is simply too limited to interpret Jesus. We need God's history. Our culture, our society, our era and time are way too providential, he says, provincial, to give the needed categories for grasping who Jesus is and what he came to do. Now, I'm going to get to the part that I, I like and I think you'll like, okay? This is, you should like this, okay? But I know this is a little tedious for you this morning, but it's helpful. And as, well, it's like when I talk to my kids, I pray they don't roll their eyes at me, that they listen to the wisdom of their father, right? Amen? <laughs> Okay, Jesus is our great high priest, but does he understand us? If you've ever went through anything difficult, if you've ever, if life has ever run into you, the problem with you when you're young is that life hasn't really ran into you yet. So you, you kind of have a lot of uh, passion, let's call it that. You kind of like a lot of energy, and you're liable to run here and run there. And what I'm telling you is that when life runs into you, you're going to need solid answers. You're going to want to know about this Jesus if you're going to rely on him for your life and destiny. Does he understand us? Look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. This was one of the most powerful verses in my life and in my faith walk. That Jesus actually sympathizes with my weaknesses. That is powerful to me. Because if we understand what a high priest was, if you go over to chapter 5, and we'll do this next week, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. It says, for every high priest was chosen among men. Why did God choose them among men? They understand you. That was one of the big things about it. The high priest was chosen from among men, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, if you're a high priest, you would be chosen from among the people. You're under what it's like. You know what it's like to face the pressures of the everyday. You know what it's like to get up in the morning and face what they were facing that day. You knew what they were going through. You understood it because you were under the same pressures because you came from among men. You know what it's like Monday through Friday. You know what it's like on Saturday. You know what it's like on Sunday. You feel the same stuff. Now, if you were a high priest, if you're carrying out your duties, you would be helped by your human experience. However, you will also be tempted by your human experience because your human nature. Have you ever worked with people for a little while? <laughs> What's it like to work with people? After a while, you kind of run out of gas, don't you? Your compassion meter kind of goes out the window. You're like, I'm out of gas. I don't think I can put up with this any longer. Or you get angry. And you start, you react in anger. Your patience is wore out. So here's what he's saying. If you're a high priest, you're chosen among men, you would be helped by your human experience. However, you're tempted by your human nature, your sinful nature. So notice in verse 2 of chapter 5, he says, he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward. So when you deal with people, do you have to deal with people who are ignorant and wayward? Let's be honest. Even I can be ignorant and wayward, right? So hopefully I understand. Now, the temptation here is to not do this, not to, to listen to what he's saying. So I may be the temptation of being apathetic. Isn't, don't we face that with our kids after a while? Oh, I don't care. I'm tired of telling you. And you let the natural consequences happen. Sometimes that's okay. Other times, oh, no, it's not good. When you give them a car, you don't want the natural consequences to happen to them. You tell them. You, you overtell them. You state, now be careful. 
Now be careful. Did I tell you to be careful? I know, Dad. And then there's the temptation to get angry, chide him, to lecture him, to just keep telling him. It's all about the rules, no relationship. Both lead to rebellion. If you have all relationship and no rules, you have rebellion. If you have all rules and no relationship, you will have rebellion. It takes balance. So the one hand, you have to guard from treating them so severely as you were obligated to offer sacrifices for their sins as a high priest and lecturing them all the time. But then you shouldn't be too lenient about their sins like a parent who has to balance between the rules and the relationship. Too harsh, you're all about the rules. Too lenient, you stop. You know, after all, when people come here, sometimes we have to tell them no. Why? Because it's about sin. It's about what God said and not what the world feels. Truth must trump tolerance. Tolerance is not to submit to truth. So when people talk about I want to do whatever I feel. What does the Bible say? As a, as a, as a person of God, as a, as a Christian, just you sitting there, does truth proceed tolerance? You have to be careful, isn't it? It's, a fine, it's hard, isn't it? It's very difficult. So, but Jesus understands us. He sympathizes with our weakness. So we have to be careful that we're not too lenient and that we ignore the truth. But we're also to be careful in not being too harsh and severe with people. That's what the priest was supposed to be like. What's supposed to humble the high priest? The idea that the high priest has to deal with his own sins. That he had to walk into the Holy of Holies and if he did it wrong, he could die. Abraham's sons found that out real quick. And they did it haphazardly. Nadab and Abahu, you can read about it in Luke, in Leviticus chapter 10 if you want to go look at it. Once a year, the Day of Atonement was the high priest alone would go into the Holy of Holies to make atonement. Then he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat in the very presence of God. And when he came out alive, the people would breathe a sigh of relief. Because... He had survived it. He made the sacrifice for himself, and he made the sacrifice for the people because it meant that God had accepted the sacrifice for the sins for another year. So like the high priest, Jesus mediates between God and us. and He's humanity's representative. He's always before God. He's not like the earthly high priest. He doesn't, he's there right there by God all the time, interceding on our behalf. And it's, he's interceding, and he's always available to hear us when we pray. That's what's so powerful about it. And he sympathizes with our weakness. He knows what it's like to be one of us. He became flesh and blood. If you cut him, he bled. If you bruised him, he bruised. He grew up. He was a little baby. Then he got, he got to become a teenager. And then he got to be a man. And he worked as a carpenter. He knew what it was like. He probably hit his hand with a nail or a hammer. I don't know whether he did or not. Well, Jesus is perfect. He did. We don't know that. I hit my hand the other day. Ooh, hurts. But we need to trust that Christ understands us. So the second thing that we need to understand is that he was tempted as we are, and yet he's without sin. He's perfect. And so, therefore, the writer says, draw near to him. And I'll, I'm going to finish quick, quickly. We can come confidently to the throne of grace. Why? We're not coming based on our record. We have, a, we have someone who's paid for our sins. We have a high priest who sympathizes us, who has forgiven us of our sins. And if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive our sins. So we can come based on his record and not my own trusting in his record of righteousness, that we've been justified before God, that we can enter in with confidence. Secondly, that we can go early and often to God. 
It's not like when uh, your parents only talk to you when you're doing the right things and give you an uh, ice cream cone when you do the right things. They, give you, they take you out to dinner or give you an ice cream cone sometimes when you're not so good. Jesus, when we come based on his record, when we come trusting in his promises of his mercy and grace that we will find that, then we will come more early. In other words, we won't wait so long. Now, if I think about myself, I may hesitate to go to God. God doesn't want anything to do with me. But if I come based on his record, I will come to him early. It, it, I won't wait because I could trust him. I can trust him because he knows what it's like to be me. He understands my weaknesses. He understands my stuff. And so I can go to him as early as I need to. I can go to him as often as I need to. And I can come expecting what? I can expect mercy and grace. That's what he says, that you will find help in your time of need. That you can, as they say, come to the throne of grace. Come boldly. Now, where do they get that from? Right out of the same scripture. It's out of the King James. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find our help in our time of need. What I'm saying to you is that if I come based on Christ's righteousness, I can expect to find his mercy and his grace. Expect it. That's powerful. I don't have to be afraid. So draw near, he's saying. Draw near, because you will find help in your time of need. Where do I get that from? Right there. It's a promise. Let's pray. Father God, we are your children, and like your children, help us to understand these things. Help us to know that your sacrifice has been made. There's no more sacrifice, not even on our part. We don't have to work to do anything. We can just trust in you and that we will find help in our time of need. I ask, Lord, now that you would bless us with the understanding that we can trust this. We can trust Jesus. We can trust your word. That he is our great high priest. He was appointed by you before the foundation of the world. And he sympathizes with our weaknesses. He understands our pain. He knows our temptations. He understands, Lord, and can make amends. And he can offer us grace and mercy. He can give us forgiveness. He can lift the burden of guilt off of our shoulders. He can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can clothe us with the robe of righteousness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can know that we have eternal life because of Jesus, our high priest. He is our high priest. He is the one who's offered sacrifices for our sins. He is the one who puts his hand of grace out for the hand of faith, that we can trust him, that we can come boldly, and we can draw near. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I love that song. I love that. Play those things louder back there. <laughs> Let me just say this to you. The one thing that's so powerful about this, and that's what I, I, I make a big point about, is that he sympathizes with my weaknesses, blew me away when I found that out. And that he understands everything that I'm tempted with. Because I always felt like that God was way out there. But he's really right here. And so, put your confidence in Christ, and he will lift you up. Hear the words of the benediction from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do this will, working in us, do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.